probably the panel discussion will be a bit shorter, let's say uh, half an hour, no more than that, and then uh, we drift uh, towards the upper or the near, uh, in the other room. Good, so uh, panel discussion means, uh, you know, welcome uh, to ask any question that you want uh, for our speakers. And okay, probably I'll start with one. Um, so this morning, uh, the, uh, not this morning, but at the beginning of the symposium, I was uh, uh, mentioning uh, that uh, in 1992, we didn't have optimization uh, uh, tools uh, so advanced as we have today, but also computation were uh, a bit lacking behind uh, and, uh, uh, and control at the same time. I mean, it wasn't that developed as today. So my question is for you, uh, what do you think we need uh, uh, to, uh, to strengthen in order to uh, make progress uh, in the, uh, you know, uh, marrying of uh, control uh, and your network could be uh, something from the domains that I've cited, but also if you think that we should take inspiration from other domains of science, this could be also a, a very good uh, point. So, what's your opinion about it? Well, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure it's answering your question, but uh, I think it's important for people to, to be affluent in both, okay? for people in control theory to understand well the problems in machine learning, but also for people in machine learning to understand dynamical systems and, and things like that. You know? which is not really so much training in, in computer science. You know? So I think a good start is that everybody learns the, the vocabulary and the questions that the other groups are using. Thanks. Any other? So I think, I think you, made, you, you, you had one slide up there, which I agree with fully, which, is, which put PyTorch and TensorFlow in the front stage. And so I think if there's one thing that has accelerated the development of deep learning, it's actually been the widespread availability of automatic differentiation tools um, to the point where people can use them even if they have no idea how they work or what they're really doing. Uh, and this is maybe a cynical viewpoint because you know we, we really like to think that you shouldn't use these tools unless you know a little bit about them and you can do more good damage than good and all these sorts of things, which I don't really disagree with. But let's also acknowledge that the, the vast advances in deep learning have stemmed to a very large degree from the fact that there's very widespread, often incorrect tutorials out there on how these things work and what they're doing and you know, how to use them. But it's just become this sort of hacker's landscape, right? Where people can just play around with these things easily. It's all open source. They can download, install them very quickly. You know, Conda install one thing and you have your all these libraries, right? And I, I am of the mind that this is, the, that, that we need to just build these efforts in every every field that wants to get popular. I mean, it doesn't hurt to have sort of very cool results, like you can make pictures with a, you know, a sentence and things like this, but um, for fields that want to be popular, it is incredibly beneficial to have tools that are easy to use and set up and use it and, and just and just play with. Uh, and so I, I think we need more of this. Yeah. So uh... I mean, since I, I work a lot also on perception, I have to say nothing would have been uh, possible without GPUs. Um, the problem is, so we are now consistently relying more and more in simulation. The problem is that there is, there is this sim to real gap. What I observe is that uh, there is still a lack of simulators, good simulators in robotics. Um, that applies also to self driving cars. I would say that uh, Carla is a very good simulator for self driving cars that uh, has popped out in the last uh, few years for drones that start to be. Uh, what is not happening much is uh, good simulators of sensors for, for mobile robots. I mean, they are still simulating the sensors in a perfect manner, but they don't model all the, not just the, the noise, noise is the easy part, but all the things that are actually more difficult to model, including corner cases. Um, I think, however, that the self-driving car community is doing a good job at that. More difficult is for, for the rest of the robotics community because you are working on such many different tasks that it's difficult to, you know, to focus. So robotics is very fragmented compared to the computer vision or, or self-driving car community. So that's why I think it's progress is more slowly, but we are getting there. Great, thank you. Yeah, I, I just want to, uh, I agree with my fellow panelists. I want to add a little bit about like what I think would is still missing is uh, like in terms of control can be very useful in many problems, even societal problems, like a lot of the things you will hear about tomorrow. I think what is like still a little bit missing here is how would we describe, how would we character, character good behavior 
what it mean by safety, you know, like societal problem as a control problem. How would we understand this model? Is that a dynamical model or something else? Can we, how can we bring the control knowledge and the machine learning? So now like there is a machine learning and control can, can like a lot of us are showing that there's a way of bringing together the strength of both. But uh, in terms of how to understand a model, how to understand the behavior still uh, uh, kind of the thing we're missing here, like for for the society problems, for system engineering, this system engineers, they normally do not really cannot describe their system as like a dynamical system. This is a control objective we want to have. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, questions from the audience? <coughs> yeah, please. Following up on your talk about the tools. Mm -hmm. uh, one alternative could be to develop better tools that are more easy to use. I mean, we are using different technology that is so standardized so it's uh, safe to use instead of understanding. I mean, which which tools do you use normally? I mean, uh, internet, this uh, TCP IP communication, etc. I mean, that use without thinking about it because if you know it's works. Okay, yeah. So well. And so, so sorry, what are you suggesting for the tools uh, okay. that we have? Is it, is it always the case that we have to uh, understand better how it works, or can we develop simpler tools? That oh, you yeah, know, I'm I'm all for uh, levels of abstraction and people that I mean, I, I I'm teaching a course this semester on how to write your own. PyTorch. So I love this stuff. I, I really love automatic differentiation. I think it's a beautiful technology. I don't think most people that use deep learning necessarily need to understand how PyTorch works, right? Um, or how linear algebra works on GPUs, right? Um, I also like that. We also, we also implement that. <laughs> um, so I'm all for modularity and levels of abstraction. And I think that's actually what's happened very well in deep learning is that most people using these tools have no idea how they work. That can be a hindrance sometimes, but honestly, sometimes it's probably fine. A lot of the time it's fine. Um, there is an interesting uh, gap, I do think, in machine learning as a whole, where the, the, the model of machine learning, if you don't understand the basic principles of optimizing a loss function and training data and test data, uh, it can be very hard to understand. People get into very, very bad uh, modes that way. Uh, so it, it is somewhat field dependent. But certainly for, the, for some cases, and I think, frankly, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and JAX are great examples of this, there really is just this notion where we can just release these tools. And I think those are good tools, to be very clear. Those are great tools. Um, I think we need more of that, to be very clear, was my, was my main point. And we should do more things like this, where it's as easy to install whatever tools you want as that. Um, and I, I, that's not always the case, right? I, th I think dealing with a lot of simulation, a lot of control, the tools are not as nice to use as I think PyTorch is to use. It's certainly much harder to install on my computer, right? Um, and this is a problem, I think, for the field. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> from the presentation. Uh, a part of uh, the presentation today was um, uh, about using learning to avoid collisions and uh, crashes. Uh, uh, so uh, I would like to ask um, uh, if, uh, I don't know how naive is the question, but um, if, at, especially at high speeds, collisions will always happen. So we saw that above some speeds, uh, the performance rate uh, drops significantly. Uh, can we explicitly uh, take into account in the design of the control um, and the minimization of the damage once the uh, co collision has happened, because it's something that we didn't discuss. So let's say that uh, the collision is unavoidable and we are going to crash. Can we take into account in the controller design the, the minimization of, of, of the damage? My first reaction would be yes. Um, like. You can define your safe not just as contact. You can define your safe as a function of both distance and velocity. Like the closer you are, you want the velocity to be slow. So that's not, not like a, a significant barrier to, to use this type of work. That's my kind of my first reaction. And your um, 
said you you mentioned that at the high speed the collision is not avoidable. I don't know what you mean. Like what kind of setting you have in mind? Like the air commercial aircraft that speed up pretty high, but the collision is avoidable. They're not colliding, but you have to give them enough space separation from from each other. I guess your problem is. With high speed, you really need a lot of actuation, actuator force to make you turn before you collide. Now that's like, uh, so that's something we observe. For example, this uh, local certificates cannot really avoid, right? Like barrier can tell you where you should probably turn for the next step to be further away from unsafe, but it cannot see very far away. How would you do that? You actually need some sort of a good planning algorithm to, to give you that long-term information. That I think that itself is a very interesting problem in, like, in, in the problem I study. In the racing, um, the risk is kind of uh, baked into the training process. So when we uh, train the RL agent, we basically want to we penalize uh, collisions and missing the gates. Then when we collect this additional uh, data from the real world, we basically use them to improve the simulator. It means the aerodynamics and the uncertainty. So we lower the risk of, uh, of collision. So when we have collision, it's, uh, it's due to things that we could not predict because we still don't have a perfect model of reality. For example, um, distractors like uh, dynamic range changes in the, in, the, in the visual field of view. During the public race, uh, at some point, the firefighters asked us to open the hangar doors in order to allow all the 1,000 visitors to potentially evacuate the hangar in case of fire. And we said, ah, oh, but this never happened. Well, math is low. We had to evacuate the audience an hour later because we had a collision that caused the one battery to explode for the first time in 10 years. <laughs> and, uh, and then the smoke was very toxic. We let, let the people out. Why, what caused the, the drone actually to crash uh, um, in that case? Well, since we had to train everything for uh, you know, a perfect visual kind of ideal visual conditions, the sunlight coming, because it was summer, it was June, it distracted our um, uh, state estimator that is based on vision. On uh, you know, So suddenly some areas of the image were basically washed out, the pixels were washed out, some parts, and so on. These are difficult to predict, you know, so there is always some... Uh, a model effect. Was it the open doors that caused the sunlight to be worse? Was it like a yes. the fire department caused the crash? Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> because of the open doors, the fire. <laughs> yeah. Robin, I, you all made a very compelling case about the methods you're using in a research context. I was wondering, do you think the methods are sufficiently robust, mature, and foundational that you would bring them into the teaching, even into the undergrad teaching? No, well, certainly for contraction, yes, I, I think that's true. And actually, we, we do bring it in undergraduate teaching, you know, because it, in a sense, it's a, it's a more general way to, to teach the, you know, to, rather than starting with linear systems and then nonlinear system, you can do directly things like contraction. You know, so. so, yeah, we, we do bring that into teaching. And I build my thesis on top of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> But and what I meant more specifically was to use now neural network techniques to find, say, contraction metrics. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so some people have done that at Caltech, for instance, and, uh, and so on. Such a soon George shot in. I thought you were going to ask if it's mature enough to bring it to industry, but bringing it to teaching maybe is even more important. Um, I think that the que it's more about um, conceptually. Nothing actually is that complicated about like one of the beauties, in fact, of, of of neural networks is that they're so once you have these building blocks, they're so simple and most people can understand uh, the math is not very deep. It's actually quite, quite straightforward. Um, the bigger question to me is, is it, is it is it established enough to really warrant teaching? I don't think anything I had there was was frankly. Um, established enough yet to really <laughs> introduce to under the undergrad level. Um, there's maybe a few elements of some of our work that's getting there, but it's a matter of it's, you know, it's not part of the canon yet of neural networks. And there's so much going on that I think there's more important things to teach currently until they're better established, uh, maybe a few years, hopefully a few years from now, right, <laughs> to become to become uh, part of the canon. Otherwise, there's just too much to cover right now when it comes to neural networks. Yeah, no, I agree with that also. I mean, a lot of the papers that you see in neural networks is a small improvement on the previous paper, you know, and 
gets a thousand citations and then it completely disappears the following year and nobody cites it anymore. Right? Yeah. And so that's not the kind of thing you really want to bring into undergraduate teaching. What I observe is that uh, your networks are uh, lowering the barrier of entry into robotics. Mm -hmm. So to basically say what, uh, what they were saying before. So if before you needed a lot of expertise in uh, perception, planning, and control, uh, and it was very difficult to find unless you recruit, for example, your master thesis students from uh, an engineering field or the robotics master, which we've had at ETH uh, since 2009, it would be impossible with other people. And now what I observe is that actually the percentage of people coming from the computer science domain to do a master thesis in my lab is increasing. And they don't know anything about uh, path planning or perception, but they are basically just tuning this con training, these controllers, and then uh, magically flies. Mm -hmm. That's what they see. Uh, but of course, the problem is that then they cannot debug. They don't. They cannot interpret what's really causing this. Uh, they don't have like you know the more the the theoretical understanding of what's going on and how you could have done it if without it. Mm -hmm. Perfect, because this sort of my counter argument, why not bring the teaching? Because it's just a tuning exercise. Yeah. But we are bringing it to teaching yeah. this year for the first time. Mm -hmm. I think there's this misconception, actually, that neural network training is all about just tuning hyperparameters and people are just guessing. And, and there's certainly an element of that. But actually, I would say that getting neural networks to work well uh, it is is really a skill. It is really an engineering skill, and going through the steps of how you debug network structure, it's a skill that should that it that can be taught like anything else. And maybe we should teach that uh, over any individual method, <laughs> but because it, it's not it's not just hyperparameter tuning. There 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 are it seems like it, but uh, if if someone you know is training their network and doing a big grid search over hidden unit sizes, they're not doing it right. They're 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 mistaken in how they conceptualize classes of neural networks, um, that's not how you train, that's not how you debug a neural network, right? Uh, so I think there are there are definite ways to do it properly and that probably should be taught. Scaling laws and things like this are, are becoming really kind of a an empirical science, but I would say it's becoming like a, like like the, the science of developing neural networks is almost like a, a biology at this point, right? It's, it's the, you, you can't build it up from first principles, so you have to study it empirically, but it is still a science. Yeah. So, so, so the first thing to know is that all neural networks are the same. Uh, your architecture of choice doesn't really matter when it comes to a lot of things. I mean, I know that's funny given what I talked about, right, about constraints architecture. But if you have generic purpose architectures, just, you know, a convolutional network, um, the difference in different architectures is, for the most part, noise other than normalized to say parameter count or other things like this. I know this is, so hopefully they're not to be hardcore machine learning people on here that will criticize aspects of this, but these are all first approximations, right? So for example, the thing you should always do is, is it, you, 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 there are a few debugging things you can do, right? So you have to make sure that your architecture is able to overfit a small batch, right? So you wanna make sure that your architecture and optimization are sufficient. If you give them a small batch of data, they will fit it exactly. If they can't do that, there's something wrong with your training procedure and it just doesn't work, right? So first try to fit, fit a, I mean, first try running things because you probably will anyway, but if it doesn't work, then first try fitting a small batch. Then <clears throat> try fitting your, data, your, your training data exactly, right? So try fitting your training data exactly and see what your test error does, see what your test performance does. And then try not explicit regularization like weight, like, like weight decay, because that doesn't really have the same effects, but regularization like dropout or things like this. Um, these all do depend on the architecture type you're talking about here because different architectures have different sort of t types of these things. But these little, like, this is kind of, and, and to be honest, at, at some point, um, it's actually my students that really know this much better than me because they're the ones really training these networks and I, and I just sort of hear this a lot of it secondhand. But there is this sort of science of things you try, right? Um, don't worry too much about your learning rate schedule, but that's the more matter of speed of training rather than a matter of, of whether it trains or not. But you have to tune in a little bit to make sure that you're not leaving a lot of accuracy on the table. Um, there, there are all these sorts of rules of, of thumb that that do have, honestly, um, th th that are codified over a long, you know, over a lot of different sort of resources, and probably should be brought together in a better way. And there are some sort of, you know, like hackers' guide to, to machine learning and stuff like that that kind of bring these things together. But um, that's a, that, that's a small 
subsample of the things. So hopefully give you some notion of the kind of things I mean when I say that. Um, so, you know, look at architecture sizes and then, you know, normal. <laughs> don't worry, normalize to the same size. Don't worry too much about different architectural choices because they don't really matter. Normalize to size of the architecture overall and um, and then and then sort of, you know, overfit first and then regularize until you're kind of in the right zone of, of, of underfitting and stuff like this. And conversely, what's exciting is that, you know, with so many people and smart people working on neural networks, but you, you, you start having all sorts of new architectures like, like transformers and, you know, sports based diffusions and things like that. And, uh, you know, the, so the, for instance, score based diffusion is what allows precisely, you know, to say a sentence like, uh, Generate a picture of the, of the dog in a sushi house, and suddenly, you know, five seconds later, appears a dog in a sushi in a house made of uh, of uh, temaki, right? And uh, so that, that those are those are kind of new uh, new uh, um, methods, which are actually this one, the score based diffusion, is strongly based on dynamical systems fundamentally. And the original idea, actually, not of square based diffusion, but the math which allows it, was done by Brian Anderson, who is a uh, an adaptive control expert, one of the uh, in the um, in the nineteen eighties, right? So, uh, so actually, the, that's the first reference to the score of a diffusion is by Anderson's paper, you know, showing that the reverse of a diffusion is a diffusion. One fundamental problem that I found in machine learning is like robustness versus like generalization. Mm -hmm. The moment you start regularizing your neural network, you lose the nominal accuracy. Mm -hmm. So, my question would be the to the panelists would be like. Is it because of the architecture that is something embedded in the neural network architecture that we cannot avoid no matter what we do? Or maybe we need some other architecture such as like Google is introducing some new architectures or kernel-based learning. So what would be your like, saying on that? So I've worked, a, so I didn't talk about it today, but I've worked a huge amount in robustness. Um, and I've come to the conclusion that I don't, I, so this is sort of you know, adversarial robustness. We're trying to make networks that can uh, recognize images with the same accuracy as normal classifiers, but you can't change a few pixels here and there and make it change entirely. Um, so for those that don't know, uh, neural networks right now are incredibly non-robust, meaning you can change images imperceptibly and make them change their output completely. Um, and I've come to the conclusion that I actually don't understand uh, <laughs> why this is, despite working at it. So, so no matter what you do, you cannot make a network that is able to achieve the with our current architectures that is able to achieve level of performance while being while being robust. Um, that's true of other architectures, by the way, too. That that, that that seems to be. I mean, this is a a feature seemingly of high dimensional statistics. That this is this is likely true of a lot of architectures. Um, what I find very interesting, though, uh, and, and and this in some sense makes sense because. As you as you smooth your architecture to the point where it's it's sufficiently smooth to not have the adversarial examples, you kind of you know you, you have less expressiveness. You, you you lose a lot of the benefits of it. it. It still doesn't really make sense to me for the following reason, though. It's more of a generalization question, right? So everything we know about generalization theory says that if you can fit your training data, which all the methods do, with a simpler function, that function should generalize better. And we do not see that. We see the opposite, right? We have a smoother function that, that so we can train our bus network to get zero training error and it generalizes much worse. So what that means is the actual notion which networks are simple is not about Lipschitz smoothness, right? It's about simple in terms of the implicit biases of an architecture trained by SGD to find some optimum. That is a better notion of simplicity than simplicity in terms of Lipschitz smoothness, right? Which which adversarial robust networks have, but don't generalize well. So it is, it is a mystery and confusing to me still, having worked in it uh, for, for, I guess we were publishing those papers first in 2018, so I've worked in it for, for four years now. Um, uh, no one understands it, quite simply, uh, I don't think. I, I, I think we fundamentally don't understand the nature of generalization in networks enough to understand why this is really happening. Sort of like new architectures and what worries of language models 
doing different tasks in every day, but do you see anything in that direction applied to the system control, especially with the like uh, stuff that is implemented today? I know there's a strong argument that architectures don't matter as much, but like is there something to leverage from that direction or to see you know any additional theory that needs to be Yeah. I mean for, for personally I personally I would not would not say that architectures don't don't matter as much. But but you know, so so in deep learning you already have dynamical systems, right? So you basically when you go from uh from uh, input to output, you go through a series of steps, which actually is a dynamical systems, which later on was called a neural ODE, but that's fairly obvious, right? Uh when you do backprop, it's it's uh, it's also a dynamical system, right? Uh, uh so that, that, that's very natural. Uh, so if you do scores based diffusion, that's fundamentally a dynamical system. It's defined as a dynamical system, right? And so, uh, so from that point of view, it's it's kind of very natural and it's very nice because then you can start saying, well, you know, if uh, uh, you can start analyzing it from a, the up and off or contraction point of view, you can think of combinations of things too, right? Because you know, in the brain, there's not one neural network. There's lots of neural networks interacting and things like that. You know? So, so I think it's a very exciting time for that. Point of view, you know, and particularly as a very few people will really understand what's going on. Yeah, please. I have a slightly play different track, but the last two speakers specifically mentioned you know, hardware examples and running real world experiments. And I was wondering, kind of the computational aspects of these machine learning and emerging control machine learning, are we able to? Still progress forward with more advanced methods, or have we started to hit computational roadblocks and kind of hit the computational wall in which we can do this? Okay. So, indeed, it's a very good question. So, our networks are not uh, deep, but they are very shallow. Okay. The number of layers uh, usually don't go, doesn't go beyond 10. And we do an architecture search. So we try to basically benchmark the performance of different number of layers in simulation until we reach a kind of a decent performance so that we can actually deploy to the real world. But here, really, our experience plays a role. Uh, we never really face the problem of uh, the, the uh, wh whether we need a more computing power in order to do certain tasks, uh, but uh, I would say that by the moment you start uh, then introducing semantics, which is, for example, the case for self-driving cars, this is certainly the, uh, you are then uh, it's, you're hitting the ceiling. Um, we, I think we are close to that because in the end we also want to do now vision-based RL, so try to go closer to what human pilots uh, do and uh, reason. And there already we, we, we have started in parallel to also try to offload the computation to an external machine. So for the past 13 years, we've been working on board the computer vision and control. But now we want to actually go back to try to offload uh, some things, especially vision to uh, an external computer, because then we can leverage more powerful GPUs. Um, it really depends on the complexity of the task to answer your question. Yeah, I. I... Our neural network is uh, even shallower. We never go beyond three hidden layers and it works because like, we don't have to have more to make it work. Um, I, and there are, like, of course, like computational complexity is always a problem, not just for machine learning. It's a problem for any NP complete problem and any problem more difficult than that. If you want to find a solution, you have to face this computational complexity issue. Now, what we feel that is neural network as a function approximator, it actually might save some computational power by doing training in a different kind of environment, for example, in simulation. And it's not, it doesn't take really a lot to, to have this neural network to run on board. And there are a lot of technologies like um, on what they call like a tiny machine learning. Basically, you train using a lot of parameters to overfit. And then you from that big neural network, there are a bunch of technologies people are studying to kind of scale this neural network down, scale the size down, and still keep the same performance. I think that's like a huge topic in a different domain, like the hardware, basic FPGA people, they've been studying this problem for, for a while. I would say like this computation, you really have to see, look at when it's going to happen and what's the right way of create abstractions to make sure they, when you use this abstraction, it's the computational, like you don't really hit the ceiling of computational power. That's just my- yeah, And there are some very elegant questions as opposed to answering in that domain. So for instance, 
uh, a long time ago, which is one year ago, which is a really long time for this, uh, for, for this field. You know, people were talking a lot about what's called the lottery ticket hypothesis, right? With the idea that if you have a very big network, there's really a sub-network which is doing all the job, and you might as well train directly the sub-network and have a much, much more efficient thing. And it's plausible that things like that uh, occur. I'll make, oh, sorry. I'll make actually two follow-on points. Um, since there was a lot of talk about architecture choice, I, I, I should have clarified my point about architecture not mattering. To be very clear, I mean for a first pass, they don't matter, right? So when you're first looking at data, don't try to optimize architecture. Try to just get your problem working with a larger network. Where architectures do really matter definitely is when it comes to hardware, right? Because you cannot, you know, the hardware, like the performance compute trade-off is definitely very architecture dependent. The second point I actually wanted to mention relates to the point back there about these, these large language models, large pre-trained models. Um, and I, I'm so first of all, uh, and this is now an opinion, also like like everything here. But I'm I'm fully on board with these things. I mean, I don't do work in them, but I am completely sold. We're pivoting completely in this direction. Um, I see this as as large a change as deep learning was ten years ago, right? So we are from now on not going to train models anymore. We are going to use existing models and prompt them to do everything, and this is. This works and it's crazy, and we need. And, I mean, and it says, I mean, I, I, I don't know what application. I mean, I don't know the impact it's going to have on our existing tasks, let alone new tasks like control, because because we we don't have the foundation models for for those domains. So how do we build them? How do we? It's it's amazing. Um, but that field, I'm 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 fully on board with this. So so it is it is thrilling what's happening right now in this field. It is as important a change as deep learning was ten years ago. How like deep learning 10 years ago, it started in large scale domains where you had the most impact like vision and like language and then propagated everywhere else. That will also happen. So in five years, we're all going to be talking here about foundation models for dynamics, um, not deep learning for dynamics, uh, completely on board. I don't know how to do it all. I don't know like how the, where the compute's going to come from. I don't know who's going to build the models. I don't know how we should get the data for the models, but it's going to happen and we should all uh, Start working on that immediately. <laughs> well, we don't even. So the, I mean, the, the, the funny part is, we, we like you know, we don't even understand what's happening now, and that, and we're already saying, okay, this is now old. Let's go on something else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other question relates to architectures again and maybe computational power. So uh, I would be curious to hear your opinion about different types of computation, really, like uh, say even non von Neumann types of computations, neural market chips, quantum. What is the role of those models of computation in all of this? So, so neural market chips, of course, I mean, one of the main motivations is power consumption, right? I mean, the brain is running at 20 watts, right? And uh, and most uh, what most of what's going on in deep learning involves, you know, banks of computer running very in close proximity to electric power dams, right? Uh, so there's a big discrepancy in terms of uh, of energy, and that's what's that's one of the motivations for for neural the computing. I I I like them. I follow the. The work done in neuromorphic computing, both uh, for uh, computer vision and control. So we've used uh, some of them. Uh, so far, I've been a bit disappointed by the expressiveness of this uh, spiking networks. Um, so what most neuromorphic people usually do is that they try to solve it using conventional uh, artificial neural networks, and then they map them to some uh, pre-trained model of uh, SNNs. Because at the moment, back propagation with SNNs is still not completely solved, and so then they don't really can they not really fine tune. So and then when you then uh, do it in the in the real world, they don't really do so well. If you look at com uh, neuromorphic computing for computer vision tasks, so far uh, the tasks have only been um, hand character recognition, like MNIST classification, quite disappointing. Some binary classification for for face detection. Uh, and actually, there they found a lot of applications. So actually, Professor Giacomo Indiveri, uh, who has been working on neuromorphic chips now for for twenty years, and he has uh, three startups in Zurich. And one of these startups has found uh, huge applications where basically they have a, a neuromorphic chip to, uh, integrated uh, uh, behind an event camera. 
The camera and the neuromorphic chip together, they consume less than one, mil one milliwatt. And what it does is just to recognize faces. This has been installed in uh, tens of thousands of, of uh, door openers in China. <laughs> you don't need to connect them to the, uh, to the power, to power supply. They just stay there and they just trigger opening or closing of the door. And they're super robust. So this is a great application, very simple, you know, uh, binary classification and it works. So they are shining in that area. So that doesn't mean though that in the future they will not find also other applications. But we still need to understand what to do to bring them to the same level of com uh, complexity of tasks where standard ANNs work well. So I believe you also mentioned quantum. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not expert in either like neuromorphics or quantum, but as a, like a person with formal method background when when you do verification or synthesis, almost everything is NP-complete or more. I kind of give all my hope to quantum in a sense I feel that's the only path I can see that can solve P equals to NP problem or make it no longer a problem. But other than that, I, I like, but like basically what I want to say quantum is not just solving machine learning problem. It's going to fundamentally change almost everything we do today. But I don't know how to get there. I have no clue <laughs> but, like, but how that is going to Quantum work. can't solve P versus can't solve NP so, hard problems. <laughs> it, makes, it doesn't make sense, right? That's important. But it, well, but it can't. I mean, it's not. Current quantum. They don't right? think, so the theorists don't think that uh, quantum computers can solve NP complete problems. That's their best guess right now. There is a class they can solve, but it's not NP complete problems. Okay, probably the last uh, question. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I have a question about the importance um, of feedback and perception. Um, and that uh, perhaps this is to a lot of the circuits for humans uh, are actually more information going into the eye than coming back. Uh, and, uh, and so Perception, I guess, as we do it now, seems to be very much a kind of a one-way thing. You perceive an environment with a variety of different senses, and it goes into your processing. Uh, so what are the directions or possibilities of allowing the processing to influence the perception? So I don't get the question. What are the processes to influence perception? Well, yeah, so is, is this considered a, a, a sort of an area to be looked at, or do you think there will ah. be any improvement? If oh, I think that it hasn't been explored much, in fact. That's a, a problem. So, uh, so motion blur is there, and what most, most people do is basically to just ignore it. Or they would uh, train a neural network to de-blur the images. Mm -hmm. But actually, you have the capability in robotics to control the agent in order to remove, to reduce motion blur. Eliminating is impossible because every pixel is coupled with the geometry of the environment. And so uh, what we proposed some years ago is to do uh, a model predictive controller that is perception aware, where the idea is that basically, since typically when you navigate, say that you want to have uh, your mobile robot to pass through the door, you need to observe the door as long as possible. So basically what you will do is, uh, will, is not to, to move the camera away, but to control the, the trajectory of the roll such that, that you keep the door, say, in the center of the image, because by doing so, you are expected to minimize the motion blur. It's simple, but how you do it. So the idea, we, we, the way we saw it is to in, 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 introduce a perception objective into our MPC. And basically what you do is that uh, the MPC is basically generates all the, the next um, observations that will come from choosing a, a given trajectory and trying to minimize that objective. And it does it very well. So we didn't really have to deblur the images or anything or use event cameras. This was enough for that. So there are many things that are still unexplored. For example, rolling shutter cameras have been mostly, so the, the fact that you have you are exposing rows of pixels at different times has always been ignored, but it's been there. Now, by the moment you start making our robots more agile, not just flying, but also quadruped and legged, then of course you start modeling the rolling shutter effect, but this has only come in the last four years. So there is a lot of things that actually are coming out now. I was also thinking from the point of view of attention, when humans pay attention to very particular things when they're trying to achieve some task. Uh, but sort of current sensing seems to pay equal attention to the whole thing and then try and extract what's important out. Yes, so you know, we talk about attention. I would also say so. 
from uh, talking to neuroscientists, it seems that uh, we humans are doing more and more predictive control. So we predict basically the outcome of certain actions. When I touch this table, I have an expectation of what the reaction forces I'm going to get. If I look around the corner, I have an expectation of what I'm going to observe. And actually, this has been little explored in robotics. So this would be nice to explore. Yeah, along the same lines, of course, as you know, human perception, and perception is a construction, right? Because if you take the, the eye, you know, foveal vision is basically seeing a, a thumb at, uh, at arm's length, and it's moving this a few times a second. So that's the only thing you see in precision and color, is a few sp sp spots of color in an entire scene, and you're filling in all the rest. Okay. And so perception is really a construction. And of course, then you can bring attention to that. Yeah. So with this question, I propose that we uh, stop here the discussion. And uh, OK, we can continue the discussion on uh, doing the archival. So thanks again.